Three, two, one. Now. Okay. Sweet. I think I got it. Uh, you know, no. I think I'm gonna keep every single one of the times we try to do audio syncing at the beginning as an <laughs> intro. <laughs> See, to show how much trouble we are constantly having getting the audio synced. Oh. What's up, guys? Manima here, and today I am joined with the Smuggler. It's a pleasure to be back. Merry Christmas again. Eve thing. I don't, know how, I don't yes. know how to pronounce Happy Christmas Eve. Is that what you're supposed to say? I think you're only allowed to say Merry on Christmas Day. Merry, Merry, um, Merry Christmas well, Eve. Well, yeah, happy that does sound that does sound kind of weird. I, I think just Merry Christmas. Merry. Um, I think that works. Yeah. Well, Happy Eleventh yeah. Day of Anime. I think that, that's a more important one. One day I, left. I, after this I was one. not invited to this anime. <laughs> Everyone was invited, man. Miracle. I invited everybody. I, was, I, I nobody nobody told me about it. Nobody <laughs> told me about it. So so here I am. Well, I mean, you know, I don't think I, I think I lack the capacity to make videos um, in that much. I probably have to plan it like a year in advance. <laughs> Six to eight months in advance. There we go. Yeah, really though. Just yeah. Let's see. Anywho, so what what are we talking about today? What 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 do we want to go over today? Well, my bad. Let me let me start this off the right way. Today we are talking about the future of anime. Because we did, we did the Ghost of, Chris, Ghost of Anime Past, the Ghost of Anime Present, and today is the Ghost of Anime Future, which is an, a lot of speculation. Yes, very much so. I don't know. Like, yeah, and, um, yeah. This mostly kind of drives like because any 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 future prediction always always is always derived from your previous experience, and kind of what you're interested in specifically too. So, um, yeah, in this video particularly, I think we're just gonna go over and outline certain. Certain trends that we think will continue into the future, um, maybe some things that are going to be happening very soon within the otaku community as a whole, and then also just uh, just some other random random industry stuff that uh, that we're looking forward to, or maybe even things that we are not necessarily excited for. Speaking of which, I, let's let's I know I know you have a, you're pretty passionate about this. Let's talk about the Scarlett Johansson movie thing, the uh, Ghost in the Shell film. Uh, okay. So I'm yeah. Um, so disclaimer, um, I I I I find this topic to be very polarizing, just for myself personally. And then between between everything that's been going on with this, I personally, in if I could put it into a few words, I am very excited for this movie. Insanely excited. So much so, like I I, and I'll, I'll elaborate on why. And it's mostly because. I have never witnessed anything of this scale occurring, like this kind of, this particular project, this being a live action anime adaptation. Never before have I seen a live action adaptation that had A-list actors and a legitimate Hollywood budget behind it. I don't care what anybody says about the Scarlett Johansson thing and the whitewashing and the trailer and the, the mindless banter that goes on speculating about how this movie is going to turn out. All this movie has to do is not suck a dick, and it will be the best anime adaptation ever made thus far. I think that's an interesting thing you, you brought up is not suck dick, because <laughs> that's a, that's an awful metaphor. But anyway, uh, what was I saying? I think the, the, the thing I'm afraid of is so, if, if for anyone who remembers, the superhero genre and even the video gaming genre right now, like the, the superhero genre is just recently started having successful adaptations. And for like... 20 plus year. I think it was uh, the first Batman, Batman, the first Batman, Batman and Robin. You mean? Yeah, th those those adaptations <laughs> were awful. They, they were, were so such bad. terrible movies. But I think it was a uh, what was it? What's the guy's name? Famous director. God, I should know this. Um, Who made the Batman Dark Knight? Yeah, oh, Batman Rises. Nolan? Nolan? Yeah, Christopher Nolan. Yeah, he was yeah, the first yeah. person to do a proper adaptation of uh, the Dark Knight Rises, and then it was followed up by uh, Iron Man, which were both like. You know, blockbuster hits and both and I, really good movies, and that created the, the correct formula of how to properly translate like comic books to film. And I think my thing is is that so like video game is still video games are still learning that. Like we haven't had one yet, but I feel like once we like once there's a hit, like maybe this Assassin's Creed movie is gonna be it. Once there's a hit, it's going to like catch, and then we're gonna have mm -hmm. a massive influx of video game movies. And I think it could be the same way with anime. Now, this is the first time they've ever tried doing a live adap adap live action adaptation of an anime. And if it's successful, I mean, I don't know. It might take 10 tries to make a good one, or they might get it on the first shot. I think it's pretty cool to think that if, if this movie is successful and it rocks, that we could see a lot more live action adaptations of anime done by, like, 
companies so, that actually so, so care I'll about the movie. So I'll correct you on that. This is not necessarily the first adaptation of an anime, or at least a live-action adaptation of an anime. Um, we do see it happen a lot over in Japan. Typically, uh, typically like slice of life anime and like um, romance anime do get like drama adaptations, but those are strictly domestically for Japan. Parasite and Initial D also got live action adaptations, but those were also aimed at Asian audiences. This is the first time. This is the first time that we've had a Western anime adaptation. Um, that actually has enough of a budget behind it to actually go and do something with it. I, I believe there was a Dragon Ball Z live-action adaptation that came out. Oh um, my god, yeah, yeah you know, about Not too one. many people heard about it. Um, it was a limited release. It probably went straight to DVD. But, and, um, and, and also the Avatar. Oh, the Avatar. Sorry, so, Avatar I mean, well, you call it Avatar Binder. an anime, right? But um, <laughs> the Avatar, yeah. Yeah, so, well, it's so, anime like, I mean, you know, so the Avatar, an <laughs> so the Avatar live action adaptation could also fall under that kind of category as well. Um, you know, the not that not that the Avatar movie was necessarily bad, but I feel it was just mediocre. Um, I feel like I feel like what's happened up until recently is the people who have been willing to make these project products haven't had the resources to do so, and the people who had the resources didn't care enough about the source material to actually make a pr property turn out in a way that's good. Um, and I think we finally, I think we're finally witnessing the two kind of come together. There are people who are both very passionate about the, the original property, that being Ghost on the Shell, and then people who actually have money. These are the producers and the people investing and funding this movie to actually make this happen and turn out well. Now, a lot of people bring up the point of Scarlett Johansson being, um, you know, the main, the main actor in the movie, and this being an instance of whitewashing, and I argue that that's not the case, simply for the reason that this movie is as much an, an I suppose, an art project as it is an investment. Um, this movie, in order to do well, is going to require a lot of money, and it requires people with deep pockets, and people with money don't necessarily like to just make it rain. Um, having Scarlett Johansson star in this movie almost ensures that even if the movie is mediocre and the movie doesn't necessarily appeal to whatever its target audience might be, um, Scarlett Johansson's name might be enough to kind of drag this movie across the finish line and make it so that it's been financially viable for the people involved. Yeah, I think that's key. I think that's a very important thing you brought up there. First off, my bad, I want to specify, I, I did mean Western adaptations, but then again, I was wrong there too anyway. But no, uh, yeah, I think the, the problem is people are like, why don't you just hire an Asian actress who can do it? And I think the problem is is that there's just not many very talented Asian actresses that are that have that kind of name that can carry that, mm -hmm. you know, there are people who are just going to go see Ghost in the Shell just because Scarlett Johansson's in it. Not because they like anime, not because they're fans of Ghost in the Shell, because they're fans of Scarlett Johansson. And to them, that gets them more money. And then you also have a guaranteed person who's a good actress. Like, you know she's a good actress, so you don't have to worry yeah. about taking a chance on someone who might be a good actress or might properly portray, portray, uh, the, uh, what, what, what did she call The, uh, Admiral, The Major. The Major. Yeah. There you go. I always forget the name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, like, I mean, yeah, I, have, yeah, um, I, I find, I find the arguments regarding, like, the negative arguments regarding this movie to be very, um, I don't know. Everybody's just so quick to dismiss this and hate it before it's even out. Like, we've seen it with all of the, all of the interpretations of this trailer. Although this being a first, I, I am honestly, I am very interested to see how this pans out because this has. I've, I've never seen this happen before. Um, all of the important people in the community are are talking about this same project and this project being made in the West. I mean, it's it's a big deal. Despite despite the reception of this being mostly negative, any publicity is good publicity. And the big, especially the big YouTubers, uh, Arcata, the Anime Man, Digibro, all these guys are giving this um, are giving this movie a lot of coverage as far as what they're talking about. So what I'm wondering, like, I know this is kind of getting off topic a little bit, but I wonder if this has anything to do with globalization. So we talked uh, recently about how a lot of people are, fear, are afraid of these growing pains of, like, anime becoming more and more mainstream. <clears throat> so I question if this whole hate on Ghost in the Shell being adapted to a live-action film has something to do with the idea that anime, if this does well, anime will become more and more common. I, I, I think that's uh, partially exactly it, and I also feel like the people who have emotionally, because I mean this is a very long-running property, and the property itself, anything is deep enough if you look at it the right way. 
This property has been around long enough and there have been enough iterations of it, and it has concepts in it which can be interpreted in a very deep and meaningful way. And I think a lot of people are almost personally offended that this property can just become another action film for the masses to enjoy. Because to them it's something special, it's something deep, they've, they've, they've looked at this work and they've interpreted it in such a way, and they feel like inside of their own interpretations, they are unique, and I, I, I want to argue that that is not the case. Um, everybody should be entitled to enjoy this film however they want to. Um, I just I just hate to see, I hate to see people get really defensive. It's almost like I'm I'm like secondhand witnessing overprotective parenting. So speaking of which, so we were just talking about globalization. So let's, let's head back to back to that topic. Uh, China and their their whole adaptation of anime that's pretty crazy. There are a lot of China, Chinese companies are starting to pick it up, like Creators Impact. Like I mean, personally, Blood of Wars was awful and I hated it. But then again, it Ugh. was their first anime, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna look past it for a little bit because they got a pretty cool thing. I think Creators Impact's making it right. What's it called? Yeah, I think it's I think it's Pack. Yeah, and uh, it's called um uh, uh what's it called? The Hero's Avatar. Uh, I think so. I think that's it. And it's basically an esports anime, which is yeah. super awesome because I, 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 I'm a huge fan of esports, and to think that they're they're able to add up the uh, the esports genre into an anime, and I think that's gonna really, I think it's gonna work. I think it's gonna be cool. I mean, it might just look, it might just be bad, but I don't know. Like the art style and the PV that they have there, uh, showing it makes it look like it's a very good show, and the, at least the the art will be pretty. Mm. And like I kind of I kind of feel like this is. Um... You can look at this as a similar thing that happened in the mid 2000s with kind of anime becoming uh, anime potentially being more art housey, kind of like uh, Boogie Pop, Phantom, and like um, uh, what else? Um, you know, you just had the more the more weird like contemplative shows. Um, I wouldn't say Monogatari was one of those, but um, uh, Serial Lane is a good example of what I'm trying to say. Um, so basically, with this occurring though, and with that renaissance, what we have is we just have an increase in the reach of anime globally. So more people are watching anime now, and enough people are watching anime to justify more niched products coming out. Ergo All Out being an anime that was completely about rugby. Now, it introduced a lot of yaoi bait, which um, which arguably makes the show um, a lot safer financially to uh, to kind of invest in and make because you already have the Fujoshi crowd that's into that. But now suddenly you have people who are really into sports, but not so much sports. Now you specifically target rugby, which is a sport that hasn't been looked at before. So everybody who's into rugby, which is really big over in Europe, and everybody who's into anime, well, that's that's just their jam. Like, there's no other anime for them. They will go and watch that, and that's like a guaranteed audience. So with this particular instance, we have enough people who play esports and enough people who watch anime around the world to financially justify this product. And not only that, but it's just, it's interesting that it's being made in China of all places. I mean, although I do know that um, specifically China, China, Japan, and Korea all have very developed esports communities. So I mean, I think that this might be a good place for this anime to be made. It draws it draws a lot of international attention to this product. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. I I really, I think it's a pretty neat concept, and I think it's it's an interesting idea to see that China is pushing and creating anime, and and that we are actually referring to that as anime, which is something that's kind of curious because you know. One of the, the general rules of anime is that it has to be made in Japan, but now I think that ru that rule is getting so loose. Like to me, I always saw Avatar as an anime, despite everyone debating that it's not. And technically speaking, it's not because it was made in the United States, but it's very clearly anime inspired and it's done in the correct art style. So I think that's a I think that's another interesting thing, and I feel like that's, that's a rule that's going to change in the future is the definition of anime itself. Well, I mean, and I think that that, that definition, like, because when you're in Japan, anime is just animation. It's anything that's anime, animated. So it could be, like, kids' cartoons. It could be, like, Elf and Lied. Or it could be, like, I don't know, like, Aqua Teen Hunger Force, right? So I feel like us using that word specifically to describe the Japanese anime industry is kind of peculiar because them themselves don't do that. Now, that being said, too, as anime and i'm air quotes here you can't really see them but as anime continues to develop we're going to see it getting made in more and more countries 
Furthermore, most of the anime that you enjoy right now is also um, subcontracted and outsourced to other countries, specifically Taiwan. And um, a lot of uh, a lot of Kyoto Animation shows do utilize Taiwanese keyframe animators to make their shows. Um, apart from that, like, how do we do? We, do we just come up with different words to describe anime from all of these different countries? And furthermore, how do we define animation that has international involvement? Um, particularly notable this season, Drifters. Um, you still call Drifters an anime, but most of the most of the keyframe character art and even the intro has been done by French animators. Yeah, and then on the other side, you got something like a gen, which is 3D and not really done so much in an anime style, but yet it's still considered an anime because it was made in Japan. So, I, you know, it's, it's definitely, I feel like the, the term of anime is getting very loose. And I, personally, I, my, my guess is where it's going to go is going to be, they're going to finally like lock down a specific art style. And then that's just going to be anime, the anime genre that has to be done in that art style. And like a hundred years from now, they'll define anime as like, oh yeah, it originated in Japan. If you didn't know that, fun fact. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I, yeah, and I think like I think anime as it stands right now, like when I talk about anime, um, I, I more think when I think about the word anime, I think about um, animated works, 3D or otherwise, that share the same stylistic sensibilities. Basically, um, so different, different from like, because there's kind of like a genesis between animation in Japan and animation in the West. Like you look at you look at the origins of both, and both have very different um, history. So that's why you get that's why you get the different body proportions. That's why their eyes are really big, and um, because because they're looking to the West, right? The original the original idea was to look to the West for inspiration regarding this. So they they make their characters more Caucasian looking. That's just kind of like general evolution i don't know maybe that sounds a little weird or kind of um maybe uh what's the word i'm looking for maybe that kind of takes away from the anime industry i suppose when i when i when i put it that way but still they're both very different things um particularly speaking anime deals with a lot of um a lot of adult a lot of adult subject matter yeah and i agree with you and my, my, my main point was i feel like they both started in the same area because you know you had astro boy which i think was the big the big one that was in, in japan that was heavily inspired by like the the uh, the animation style in the United States. If you go back and watch Astro Boy and then the the Western shows that were in America, they're very similar. Like they're almost identical. But I think the idea is that due to differences in cultures and the fact that we had kind of a separation there, is that uh, like cartoons in America and anime in Japan like separated and branched out and mm -hmm. created their two own separate genres. And they're, now they're vastly different thanks to the change. Just the, just the different type of people working on it, I guess. Yeah, and well, I mean, looking, like, so we've been talking about the past, but looking to the future, um, so anime was originally based off of um, Western animation with a Japanese um, interpretation of the Western culture or Western the Western animation industry. Um, now what we're seeing is the reverse. So all of a sudden, with and specifically Avatar too, you look at Avatar, and Avatar is the West's interpretation of anime. So we're kind of seeing this go full circle, and how how the anime styling plays into the artistic sensibilities of the people within a country will definitely define how it's look, how it looks, the subject matter that it interprets, and you know how it kind of moves forward from there. Like if you look at Drifter specifically, you'll notice that um, that. The art styles, the art style is just a lot more. It's different, right? There are very thick lines, sharp faces. But yeah, anyways, like specifically with Drifters being kind of um, um, it, the French's interpretation of anime too, and how how that show looks very visually different from anything else that's coming out this uh, this season, but also kind of shares stylistic sensibilities with Helsing, which is kind of the which was the same material that was made by the person who wrote the manga for Drifters. So yeah, anyways, that's my that's my tangent. Yeah, no, I think that's awesome. <laughs> I think that's so cool. Like, yeah, that's finally coming full circle. That's like, you know, it went from West inspiring the East, and now it's the East inspiring the West. Which is I don't know. It's 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 really awesome to be like here as the circle finally completes. And it's, and what I, a I'm, time to be alive. It's a good time to be alive. That's that's the truth. But yeah, no, I'm looking forward to the the growth of the anime industry in the future. Speaking of which, I have your hmm. I, I have an, a question for you. So, I don't know if you know, but uh, Japan's holding the Olympics. Yep. And uh, was it four years now? Yep. Three three years or four years? 
but they're hosting it. Do you think that's going to have any sort of effect um, on the anime industry? I think it's going to have effect on the Japanese economy as a whole. Hopefully, the stimulus from the Olympics brings in more money just to the country in general. Um, if you look at the way that Japan is right now, even even specifically the anime industry, every every aspect of Japanese industry suffers from Japanese work culture. If and that's mostly due to the fact that the economy for the last 25, 30 years, if it hasn't been stagnating it's been in a slight recession now japan has been trying to fix this for a very long time but to be perfectly honest it's just a result being put into the japanese economy through foreign means because um japan has um for the longest time been a very xenophobic culture um even if you look at the the immigration laws into japan it prevents it prevents foreigners from coming in and in, and basically investing in japanese businesses um so I think that with the Olympics, the Olympics will put money back in the pockets of Japanese people. In turn, they will have more money to spend on things. Hopefully, some people decide that those things should be anime. From there, Japanese studios, like it's a trickle-down effect, right? It's a bullshit trickle-down economics that you always hear about in like social class or whatever, but it actually like, this is this is what I'm thinking. Eventually, hopefully more people will buy anime <laughs> and the animation studios will have more money to get made and then maybe, just maybe, anime won't need to be moved to China. There you go. Now, my, my main thing I'm, I'm kind of curious about when it comes to anime is what, in Japan with the Olympics is more so the uh, the idea of it spreading more. Like, I feel like, like game culture is definitely going to benefit heavily from the Olympics being in Japan, especially since, like, Mario was, like, their main mascot uh, from the, uh, the Olympics just last year. Or, no, just this year, my bad. So, I don't know. I'm interested. <laughs> I don't remember that. I'm, so, I'm, I'm interested Japan. to see if, like... If, if it's just going to be gaming culture or if they're going to incorporate anime culture into it and make anime more widespread and see if that grows the anime industry outside of Japan and just increases the amount of money they get from people buying anime from Japan, which in turn stimulates the economy. Hopefully. We're like, now we're like, a, now we're just like yeah. giving a, uh, economy lessons. <laughs> yeah. It's just like philosophic economic, like just i predict the future like my magical economic yeah. crystal ball that i just use i mean you know if you're an investor invest in anime it's it's definitely a good place to put your money there you go now we're um, giving stock advice I, yeah i think i i um yeah so like what i'm thinking like with with the olympics occurring in 2020 i think we'll see a similar kind of effect um to scarlett johansson and ghost in the shell um now that being said i think the olympics are going to be received a bit better than the ghost in the shell movie I hope. Um, I'm pretty so sure. We'll see how, That's we'll a, see how everything Olympics goes. are significantly less offensive. Anyway, thank you so much for spending some time on on your Christmas Eve day, doing another uh, video with me. It was a uh, it was a pleasure to be here, and I hope your subscribers aren't too sick of me by now. But um, on behalf of myself and Manime over here, I'd like to thank you for listening. And if you wanted to see more content like this, and even an in depth review on the response of people watching the Ghost in the Shell trailer. Check out my channel, The Smuggler. And until next time, this was The Smuggler. And this is Matt. Make sure you guys stay man. Go watch that goddamn anime.